Hi, I'm Tracy Brogan, author of My Kind of Forever, and this is Author's Voice. Hi everyone and welcome to Author's Voice, where we connect authors to the world. This is your host Sonali Dev and the show is Lit With Love and our guest today is the very lovely Tracy Brogan, my friend the very lovely <laughs> Tracy Brogan, thank you so much for being here Tracy and we are going to be discussing, <laughs> we're going to be discussing Tracy's book My Kind of Forever um, and as you can tell I try and match my clothes to the book covers. Nicely okay. done, it was very nice nicely done, yeah I kind of. <laughs> So, so um, we'll talk some more about the book, but first some little housekeeping. If you are watching this on Facebook, uh, please enter questions in the comments section and Tracy will answer them live for you. Uh, if you're watching it on the website, I think there's a comments button, so use that. If you are watching the show after it has aired on YouTube or on Facebook, you can still type in questions and you most certainly can order the book because um, Tracy will be signing books for you here. So please do order books. It is $9.99 only <laughs> from Montlake. And thanks Montlake uh, for publishing this lovely book and for sending us Tracy today. So welcome everyone. I think I got all of that out of the way. Again, this is Sonali Dev and my guest today is Tracy Brogan with her book, My Kind of Forever. All right, so Tracy. Uh, I use the word delightful a lot here, <laughs> but I have to say this book is the definition of delightful. Well, thank it's you. Just, um, just so what I, I have to say, I was in this writing funk, uh, reading funk, sorry, and everything was sounding awful to me that I tried to read, and this was the perfect balance of, uh, of light and hilariously funny without being kind of, why am I wasting my time, right? Mm -hmm. but, so it, had, and it has some meat but it's it's just lovely and light and um it was perfect for my funk so thank you so much well thank you i'm glad that it helped <laughs> so do you want to tell us a little bit about about it and take us into it i would love to um my kind of forever is the second book in my trillium bay series and anyone who's familiar at all with michigan uh, may be familiar with mackinac island which is uh, an island in northern Michigan. There's a year-round population of about 600 people. Uh, during the summer, it's very much a tourist mecca, and so during the summer, the, the population could increase up to 15, 20,000 people. But one of the really charming aspects about it is cars are banned. So there's no cars. Uh, people get around on foot, bike, um, horse and buggy. And so because of that, unique aspect of the location, it really lends itself to some, um, some fun scenes that you wouldn't necessarily be able to have in a different kind of book. So this story in particular is about Brooke Callahan. She is the oldest of the three Callahan sisters and she has been a school teacher on the island since she turned 23. Her father is the chief of police and uh, she has just been elected mayor of the town. And even though I, I will say this book is not about politics, <laughs> because is everyone is really <laughs> tired of politics, um, but she is faced with dealing with a city council that has been there forever. They're, they're, they're a bunch of dinosaurs. <laughs> they're set in their ways. And she's, even though she's 36, she's, she's the youngster. And everyone kind of is a little bit patronizing with her because they think um, that she might not be able to uh, do the job. And so her first day on the job, a private detective shows up, and she learns that uh, there is a jewel thief potentially hiding out on the island. And that, of course, throws the whole community into a tizzy um, because everyone wants to find out who the jewel thief is. And, and uh, um, so, yeah. And then, of course, there's a, a new bartender in town that of is there. He's there just for a short time, and uh, that also throws everything into a tizzy. So, That's, so first, um, Mackinac. So we mm -hmm. lived, I think, um, about 12 years um, mm -hmm. in Michigan. And mm -hmm. went up, you know, naturally went up north, not all the way to the <laughs> Peninsula, but all the way to Mackinac almost every year. Mm -hmm. 
It's one of my favorite places on earth. I love I think it. It is mm -hmm. one of, um, I think America's best kept secret. I think it's so. One mm -hmm. of the most gorgeous places. It really is. It's it, really charming. So maybe that's why. Maybe that's why this book, um, you know, connected so much because it is, uh, and the spirit of it, the mm -hmm. setting is just so. What was the setting where the books came from, or was that? Um, it really was. Um, growing up in Michigan, I had been to Mackinac a, a dozen times, if not more. I went there a lot when my kids were little. I've gone there a lot in the last couple of years, specifically to do research. And I think the fun thing about it is it's such an insular uh, community, mm -hmm. you know, where there are, there are the, um, the people who live on the island who are very protective of one another, they, of course, almost all the industry there depends on tourism, but you can see sort of that secret bubble around the people that live there. Now, do um, you actually know anyone who lives there? Because every time I visited, it was, that was definitely something that fascinates mm -hmm, you, right? Mm -hmm. You see these beautiful little houses and you think, right. uh, you know, is there a native population or is it just rental properties? And, you know, what is the community there like? And it was great right. to see this, but... Um, well, and, and some of the things that didn't work their way into the book just because, uh, you know, I, I took a lot of liberties with the reality of Mackinac Island, um, mostly for my own convenience. Um, I wanted to be able to take the story in my own direction. Um, most of the island is actually National Park, mm -hmm. and so there's all these big, beautiful homes, and um, it, they were built by all the lumber barons in the 1800s. And uh, they own the homes, but they actually have to rent the property from, I don't know if it's the federal government or the state government, but they, they pay rent on the property. F it's usually like a dollar wow. a year to, to have these big, beautiful houses. Um, and the community that lives there, uh, it's a lot of Native Americans and then a lot of Irish. Um, in fact, I interviewed a, a carriage driver who was sixth generation um, native on that island and he was his he was Native American and Irish and he was fascinating to talk to he was about uh, 26 and he was talking about what it's like to try dating on the island that you always have to like ask your relative you know this this isn't one of my cousins right <laughs> this is someone I can actually go out with so um, I got a lot of fun information from him and a lot of that went into this book in the in its predecessor because really 600 people is my daughter's graduating mm -hmm. class. Yeah. <laughs> so it's really, really tight. Right. And there's tons of people who live there, who own homes that live there just for the summer. Okay. Um, of course, in Michigan, we would call them snowbirds. snowbirds. They live there in the summer, and then they go down to Florida right. in the winter. Right. Um, or at least down to Ann Arbor. Mm -hmm. Yes, at least <laughs> to the mainland, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah because, um, you know, I mean, the story itself, and, and one of the things is that there's, um, there's this... Uh, line in the plot that's suspense mm -hmm. because Leo is more than just a bartender and right. um, he's ex-military and you know mm -hmm. of course incredibly hot of course so, <laughs> because he's a bartender You're right he, so he can you know booze you up and of mm -hmm. course he's, <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's handsome military. and he's charming yes. yes which right there is like the sexy level right of and he, he and he's writing a book <laughs> So he's got the sexy yeah. author factor. So, so did you do that? Did you go check, check, check? Yes, exactly. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. So, but but there's this whole su suspense, um, you know, track. Uh, and one of the interesting things is there's uh, there's no cars, there's no mm -hmm. getaways. Everybody mm -hmm. is going everywhere on foot, right? Or um, in carriages. So, right. Um, so, so pl plotting wise or process wise, is this um, what was? Do you start the stories knowing you will have a suspense element in it, or you know, or, or did that just kind of come out of the story? This is the first book I've had with that kind of suspense right. element, and I, I think we're using the term suspense generously, because um, but <laughs> but yes, there is a sus there's a mystery and a suspense yes. element, yeah. um, and in the case of this particular story. Um, I just kind of wanted to explore the idea of having some sort of underlying mystery mm -hmm. that all the other characters sort of get involved in. Um, and so I didn't necessarily set out to write a suspenseful, mysterious book, but it just, it just kind of came about organically. And because of the characters that I had created with the first book, it kind of lent itself to say, okay, this could kind of go off in this direction. And when I wrote the first book, 
I knew that that's what I wanted to do with the second one because I don't want to give too much away, but there were things that happened in the first book, and I thought if I, if I write the second book, I can fall back on this or I can utilize this and take it further. So it's all very vague and ambiguous. But so so yeah. Dimitri, Dimitri was still in the... So, the, the <laughs> so in, in, um, I think one of the most delightful things is that cast of characters that you created in the mm -hmm. first book. And, and you know, by definition, I think when you're writing such a tight community, and they're all just delightfully loaded. Right. Well, and, and <laughs> with, the, with the city council, I tried to make everyone sort of a caricature. There's Dimitri Krushnik, who is the beekeeper. There's Sudsy Greenwell, who is uh, one of the, he owns lots of businesses. There's Harlan Callahan, who is uh, the oh, heroine's yeah. dad, who's <laughs> very much, in my mind, uh, I picture him as Tommy Lee Jones. You know, yes. just very gruff, is, very monosyllabic. Yes. Yes. Um, that, that's always who I pictured, you know, kind of like you can sense that there might be a really sweet guy underneath, but you're not really sure. Um, and then, of course, there's, um, there's Vera von Meisterberger, who is the oversexed librarian who is fascinated with the bat population. So I took and every I, character and tried to just exaggerate their more humorous qualities. So, so writing comedy, mm -hmm. let's talk about that for a minute, because it's hilarious. There are Thank things you. that happen that are just completely like you put, <laughs> put the book down and you're like, oh my gosh. <laughs> and there's also this um, comedic timing where you know something funny is coming. You're like, oh my gosh, what is she going to say? And, and I have to say, you have to t talk about doing research about what to do with the ashes, with the remains <laughs> of the departed, because that was just... <laughs> I had a lot of fun <laughs> with old. that. Um, I had, there's, there's the, uh, the heroine's grandmother, Gigi, has three dead husbands, and they're each in an urn does. on yeah. her mantle, mantle. And actually, the reason that came about was because I have a friend uh, who had mentioned that he had to go to his grandmother's funeral. And I said, oh, that's so sad. And he goes, no, it's not really sad. She died 19 years ago. Oh. He said, well, she died 19 years ago. Why are you just going to the funeral? And he said, well, we had the ashes. Now we're going to get rid of the ashes. And so, of course, you know, <laughs> as, as we writers do, every time someone is talking, we're like, I'm using that, I'm using that. Yeah, it's all in there. My friends know that nothing is sacred, that yeah. if they tell it to me, it's probably going to go in a book. Um, and so that just got me thinking, well, here I've got Gigi with these three dead husbands in urns on the oh. mantle, and that would be a reason to... Uh, you know, have a celebration or have people come to the island or things. And so um, I just Googled, you know, what can you do with ashes? And all of these things popped up. Oh. And I thought, are people really doing that? And then I had seen on Facebook, like, the thing where you could send them in and turn them into a pod, and then it grows into a tree. <laughs> it's just, That's you know, it's so all. I don't, yeah, I don't want to use the word. No, I'm not going to use the word. <laughs> but. The peculiar, yes. it's peculiar, <laughs> Let's, yes, to yeah. each their own. To each their own, yeah. and, and discomforting for mm -hmm. me personally yeah. to think about. I would um, agree. Yeah, about my yeah. ancestors or relatives kind of resting in jewels mm -hmm. on my body. Mm -hmm. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. And I think one of the funniest lines in the book is, um, it's about her new boyfriend having a problem with her wearing her, yes. her ex-husband's <laughs> right. jewelry. So, right. uh, yeah, no, that, that would certainly yes. be a concern. Yes. But, but what they come up with in the end is mm -hmm. also rather funny. But I think her grandma was one of my favorite characters because she's, I mean, she's out there without being mm -hmm. like really cuckoo. Mm -hmm. right? She's very belie believably right. out there. Right. So. I don't know. Tell me about you, because I was just wondering, you know, to write this kind of community, uh, you know, where everybody is. First, I'm really, really now afraid to say or do anything because because <laughs> I'm going to, to use it. You're yeah. going to ridicule it in one of your books. But but I mean, you know, one of it is your perspective on mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> on the world that makes this so funny. But also, what kind of you know family and community? Like, mm -hmm. where does that come from? Where is the inspiration for this m madcap? Kind of, um. I'm not really sure. Um, what I can say is I was raised Irish Catholic, so we have that great dark sense of humor <laughs> that the more dire the situation, the harder we laugh because you're not, you know, you're not supposed to cry about things. You're just supposed to make fun of it. 
Um, and so, you know, sarcasm was always a big thing in my family, and, um, you know, it just, it, it sort of just comes naturally. And I have, um, I have a big family. I have lots of cousins. Um, I had uh, Great Aunt Margaret, who was a flapper in the 20s, and I loved her dearly. And uh, she was actually the inspiration for the character of Dodie in the Bell Harbor series. And so when I set about writing the Trillium Bay series and I had this, again, kind of eccentric, devil may care, 60 plus year old woman, I had to be careful not to make her exactly like Dodie, but mm -hmm. clearly I love crazy little old ladies oh because they seem to find their way in just about every story I have. And um, they make them, you know, elevate them. So. Right, because, because I think you can take a really commonplace situation and if you add one or two eccentric characters that just skews it towards comedy um, and you know that's certainly a coping mechanism that I have to try and skew things towards comedy um, but I think that just about anything can be funny if you set it up in the right way and obviously you don't want to be um, too flippant about certain topics but but there are only a handful of topics that doesn't have at least a certain element of humor in it. And Even if it's just to go, that, oh yeah. my gosh, that's so awful, you have to laugh. So Yeah, no, because that is. And, and, and there is often like serious situations in the book where, where you stop and you point out the ridiculous in it, mm -hmm. which, is, you know, which makes it mm -hmm. um, lovely. Mm -hmm. Because you know, if only we could do that. <laughs> Right, life. right. And you can, but it doesn't always, but, you know, not everyone, this is the thing I've learned as an author, not everyone has the same sense of humor that I, I do. And um, fortunately, there's a, a number of people who do appreciate the humor and who buy the books and enjoy them. Um, but, you know, that was a conscious decision I had to make as a new author. Um, am I going to try and change my humor or try and make it so mainstream that I don't alienate anyone or offend anyone? And I thought, I, I can't really do that. And I, I mean, I certainly try not to offend anyone. But, um, you know, the stuff that I think is funny, someone else might think is not funny. And, and that is certainly their option. Yeah, and all humor is offensive at, you know, some mm -hmm. level um, because you're offending the straight path of mm -hmm. thought almost, mm -hmm. right? And so, but, but so, so that journey also, interestingly enough, and um, is. You started historical, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk a little bit about it? I would love to, that? yeah. And I wasn't so, going to talk about that, but, yeah. <laughs> but there it is. Sort of that. Yeah. So I had always imagined myself as a historical romance writer. That was what I read, that was what I loved. And uh, I had started, you know, like many writers, had started dozens of manuscripts, never really got past chapter four. Um, and finally, when my, old, when my youngest daughter started kindergarten, I thought, all right, I'm going to. This is it. I'm going to write a book this year and finish it, or I'm going to stop telling people that I'm a writer. And I thought, you know, I have all these ideas for historical, but I had this kernel of an idea for a contemporary, and I thought, well, contemporary will be so much easier than a historical. Uh -oh. and, and so I thought, I'm going to write that book. And that book turned out to be Crazy Little Thing, which was the, the, my debut novel and the first book in the Bell Harbor series. But then I followed that up immediately with Highland Surrender, which is obviously a Scottish historical, which I loved writing. I did a ton of research. Um, I, I'm just, I'm really pleased with that book. I would love to get back to historical. Um, it, having a, a career in um, contemporary romantic comedy was not what I was expecting. And I'm super, super grateful that, that the books have resonated with people. But I never really thought that I'd be eight books in and writing contemporary romance. And so, um, I, I very much would like to return to writing historical. I have lots of ideas. Um, and what, you'll, what you might notice is that all of my books have a historical twist. And I think that that's partly why I was so drawn to write something on Mackinac Island, because they are steeped in history. Yes. All the architecture is Victorian. There's old uh, fur trading shops. And I mean, it's just so rich in history. There's the old military fort. And I wrote another book called uh, Hold On My Heart, which is about uh, a family that purchases an old one-room schoolhouse and turns it into an ice cream parlor. So all of my contemporary books awesome. have a, a, a hint of history in them so that I can get that little Good. fix for myself. Um, and, you know, I just, I think that that's, it's just something that I'm really drawn to. 
Yeah, and, and actually, I, I can't remember, but with Mackinac, there's some historic thing to the horses, too, isn't there? They're not, they, they are all descendant, descended from some horses who were brought on, something. I mean, anyway. But yeah, yeah that, we, that doesn't ring a bell with me, but. <laughs> they are gorgeous horses. They, they're, mm -hmm. you know, they're not your run of the mill. They, they look specifically like the Mackinac horses, or maybe that's just in my mind. I think that might be just, just in your mind. mind. I'm sorry, it might be a different <laughs> island. Because <laughs> there, there's, there's an island in like North or South Carolina that has particular horses that only are on that island. So I I've never been to that as, one. Sort of as an aside <laughs> to that, I know that uh, at one point on Mackinac Island, they decided they wanted to have deer on the island. And so one summer, they brought a bunch of deer over and had them spend the summer on the island. And then winter came, and Lake Michigan froze, and all the deer walked back to the mainland. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did not know that. Yeah. That is funny. Yeah. But, but coming back to the, um, yes, there is a historian also mm -hmm. in, in a lot of your books on mm -hmm. this one. But yeah, yeah, I hope you will um, go back to I that. Would like Although, to. I would know, like to. I would like to. It's uh, and I could even write a historical one set on Mackinac Island. So there you go. Maybe it could be the prequel yeah, yeah, to the yeah. uh, Trillium Bay. Yes, those are always you know great because you're Chingoteague, I think, and I may be. That's the. Is that yeah, the that's the, the island. The yeah. Okay. <laughs> is that case the name of the horse? Wants, no, yeah. that's not the name of the horse. That's the name of the island. The island, yeah. In case anyone um, is interested, that was Vicky, our producer, <laughs> with the name of the island, and she erased it. And so. I'm sure that she had to Google that. I'm sure that was not. No, it was right in your head? No. Wow. Oh, Vicky Amazing. grew up there. So. <laughs> okay, so coming back to this, I have to, um, <clears throat> I have to talk about... Um, I think one of the things that you explore in here, because you know, I mean, it is. We talk about it being a light book, mm -hmm. but but um, what struck me as fascinating was a couple of things. First, is that you don't really kind of um, step away from the darker emotions, right? I mean, this mm -hmm. is a story of sisters. Mm -hmm. um, this is a story of a single woman who's 36, mm -hmm. you know, so she does have the ticking clock mm -hmm. in her head, um, although it's not obviously there at all, mm -hmm. but but she does have the sense that I live on an island of 600 people, right? and you know, everyone I could date is either my cousin or really, you know, right. not dateable right. <laughs> for various <laughs> reasons. So she does have, have that sense. So you're, you're talking about, um, you know, women um, who are extremely successful mm -hmm. and, and do, you know, live their life, aren't waiting for a husband, right. but have that sense of, so, so sexuality in, I, you know, I hate saying sexuality in later years because, you know, 36 is not at all. It's later. not, but, but I, I, I yes, yeah, so we do live in a, a youth-focused right, culture, right. so, yeah. And in romance novels, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, not anymore, but 36 is, um, you know, is, is, st is kind of... Yeah, right it is. It's sort of right, pushing right, the envelope right, because yeah. so many of the so many of the heroines are in their late 20s, early 30s. Exactly, yeah. and, and which is also great, which is a move from when mm -hmm. they used to be in their early mm -hmm. 20s. Yeah. But, um, but, but so you do go there. You mm -hmm. go there with those feelings of, um, you know, of, of having hit a wall, mm -hmm. of being envious of your sisters, which right. is really um, a very normal, um, I think you handle it really well. It's a very normal feeling to have being in her situation. Mm -hmm. But but in protagonists, mm -hmm. it almost is like we, you don't do that, you right. know, because, um, so, so you have her and you balance it with her sense of duty because she's practically raised her uh, sisters. Mm -hmm. So that was, um, I think, you know, you do that really well, but talk, talk a little bit about that whole handling the sexuality of a 36 year old who is, um, you know, who, who, who's, who's lived on an island, yeah, and who, lives she, on an who island has limited is, experiences, and is right. filled with hormones, but mm -hmm. is, you know, <laughs> also filled with some, um, some not old fashioned, but, um, you know, well, she's the way I saw Brooke, I actually had one reader say, uh, say that Brooke was insecure. And I, hmm. of course, every reader gets to decide what what they see right. in the book. But I would argue that Brooke is not at all insecure. She's very pragmatic. She's very sensible. Uh, she was 14 when her mother died, and she had a 10-year-old and a 5-year-old sister. And her father, who is the Tommy Lee Jones character, was very gruff, and he didn't know what to do with three little girls. And, and she sort of, because of her oldest child personality, she stepped up and kind of became the woman of the house. Mm -hmm. And of course, she had relatives and friends who were helping her. 
Um, but she sort of stepped into that role and helped raise her two sisters. And she kind of put her own needs to the side. And then she, she actually, you know, she did have some dating experience. She had had a few romantic relationships, but for one reason or another, uh, you know, they, they fell apart. And she kind of was treading water for a while. And then when, when her sister comes back to the island and, and has a, a child of her own and then moves on with another relationship, she really doesn't want to be jealous. And, and there's some other people who have relationships on the island, and even her, her grandmother yeah, ends up in a, yes. in a relationship. Um, Brooke, she's not jealous in that she doesn't want them to have it, but she is envious in that she's like, that's a big part of life. You know, she's not saying, I'm putting my life on hold because I want a husband or I'm less of a person because I'm not in a significant relationship. She very much is comfortable in her own skin, but she would like to have a husband and a family and... and you know, it's just, it's natural. And I think um, I did have to be careful with that because I didn't want to write a book about a woman who was like, oh, my life will begin when I have this great relationship because she was going on with her life. She was making her life. And she that's why she, right, that's why one, she ran yeah. for mayor because yeah. she'd been a teacher for 12 or 13 years and she thought, um, I need to push myself. I need mm -hmm. to get out of my comfort zone. And I'm not really sure that dating is going to, happened for me and so she you know took that leap and and that is kind of one of the themes of the book what she doesn't realize that when Leo comes along the romantic uh, character um, you know one of his things is sometimes you have to jump even it, when you don't know where you're going to land and she's kind of saying well I think that's foolish but she'd actually already done that she ran for mayor without a real plan um, and she just thought, well, I'm just going to give it a try. And if it works, great. And then she ends up getting elected. And now she's like, okay, now what? And, but once she gets elected, she's like, well, I didn't have a plan. Now I'm going to make a plan. And so she never feels sorry for herself. She's not insecure. There is a scene where her sister takes her to Victoria's Secret. And she has never really indulged in a lot of fancy lingerie and fancy you know, underwear and things like that. And her sister always had. And, and Brooke wasn't judgmental of women who you know, had fancy you lingerie, so well. but, but she just, it just wasn't part of her, you, it you wasn't part that. of her mindset. And then, so when she walks out, she's like, I never thought that I was the kind of woman that bought fancy underwear, but now no, I, am. I am. And I, I think that's the soul of the book is, so I, I mean, you know, it's not my place to disagree with your reader, but I think. <laughs> and that's how I know, felt too, but I, was, like, I didn't, I didn't write her as insecure. She was, she's anything but, mm -hmm. and, um, and I think, um, you know, it's, it's so easy in these books to make people um, a certain kind of ideal, right? Mm -hmm. Because um, because likability, likability is mm -hmm. you know, such a relatability, likability is, is, is something people find so comforting. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think, the, for me, the true magic of the book was how you kept it so real in terms of how um, w women, like, us today, we feel, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we are um, hyper-efficient in so many ways because <laughs> right. our world requires mm -hmm. us to be. And because we feel like finally now that we can, we have to do all the things that right. we really well. And, um, and she does that, but she doesn't back away from, you know, feelings, mm -hmm. you know, which mm -hmm. is not like she's drowning in them, but, but right. I love how you balanced that out. Thank you. And, and, and so she was such a girl's girl mm -hmm. without being, you know, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, she yeah. wasn't frivolous yeah. at all. Yeah. Um, and she's not judgmental. Mm -hmm. and, and you, you no. Do that. You walk that line really, really well because it is very easy to get on one, um, you know, especially if you're writing a book with a politician, to, to kind of get on one soapbox or the mm -hmm. other, right? To either become completely the, you know, the devil wears Prada and right. things right. as opposed to the oh my gosh, you're all so frivolous and I'm mm -hmm. you know, holier than thou. And you do that lovely um, thing, especially with the two sisters, because mm -hmm. one of them is, you know, the fashionista. And, right, and exactly. So. And I think there's a line in the book where she says, you know, I was always considered the smart one. And I never sh was sure if that was a compliment or a concession. And she said, but either way, uh, now I'm going to prove I am the smart one. Um, and, and when she talks about how beautiful her sisters are, She's not saying it in a, in a spiteful way. Yeah. 
she's like, you know, my, my sisters are really beautiful and I'm pretty average. And of course, you know, she's not, she's she's not like average, okay. but, um, but you I know, mean, I did want to make her realistic. Real. And every one of us, I mean, I don't think I know a woman who has not had, or a human who has not had the feeling that someone is so gorgeous mm -hmm. and it's, um, you know, like my mother and my daughter are both, and I always say I'm kind of sand sandwiched between two truly gorgeous women. And, um, and that sounds envious and it's really not. There mm -hmm. is, you know, there's this, this wonder to it, but there is like a little tinge of, mm -hmm. you know, envy which kind of pushes your personality in directions, which has right. happened exactly to Brooke, which, mm -hmm. you know, is, is where she's the smart one, mm -hmm. and, you know, so, um, so whatever we believe about ourselves, right or wrong, pushes our personality exactly. and our life journey, and so that was mm -hmm. fabulous. And, and Leo is, um, you know, oh, <clears throat> the other side of it is, uh, he again is a man's man without mm -hmm. at all being, you know, in any way an alpha hole. So mm -hmm. again, you know, yes. you do that really, really well because he isn't like, well, oh, I've seen you and, you know, I'm ready to change my life's journey and all my, mm -hmm. you know, how belief system. Well, and I had to temper that because I knew that he was there temporarily. Right. And, sh every, you know, it's clear at the beginning of the book that he's, um, you know, there temporarily. And so I really did have to try and temper that with, okay, she's attracted to him, he's attracted to her, they'd like to pursue this, but they both know that he's temporary, and she just became the mayor, so she can't necessarily leave. And, and what are they going to do about that? Um, and I had to make sure that, you know, because he, he pursues her in this book, and I really had to be careful that even though he was pursuing her, um, that he didn't come across like he was just looking for some action. Plus he really she, liked she her. She retains her power mm -hmm. in that whole exactly. thing. Exactly. Right? At, at every point, you, you're very conscious of, she's very much part of that. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not, she's not someone being pursued, but she's very much part of that. Mm -hmm. She's, she, he's, he's, um, he's only, they kind of, there's a give and take mm -hmm. because she's not pursuing him, but she's very much, you know, mm -hmm. in, in that with him together. Right, so right. So her attraction is very real too. Right. And, and Vicky's been flashing the 1230 <laughs> card at us and we have, we got so, um, we're just having such a good time chatting that. with each other. I forgot we were on camera. All right. Okay. So we have Leslie, um, Leslie Sicola saying hi. Oh, on hi, Facebook. Leslie. She just won some stuff on my, <laughs> her release day. She won oh, some yay. stuff. Congratulations. <laughs> All right. Um, three orange on her mantle. What kind of guy marries a woman who keeps ashes of a dead husband on her mantle, says? Well, <laughs> see, so that's the thing. Um, he... Gigi and this gentleman are kind of doing a test run for a future relationship. And he says right out, no, you may not bring your three dead husbands. You can move in with me. But and the husband's... George, her age. Yes. So, yes. But what is Gigi's age? She's, She's around 65. Right. So, I yeah. mean, you know, it's... Yeah. And I mean, again, every, this is someone that she has known forever. He's actually the brother of her arch nemesis. And so that's part of the scandal. Um, and, and that's, you know, that was a nice part of comic relief of him saying, you know, you've got to get rid of the dead husband. That's They're not welcome in my home. So. so thank you, George, uh, for that question. And Priscilla, our friend Priscilla Oliveira says, uh, ooh, I love Dodie. <laughs> thank you. I love Dodie too. <laughs> and Gabrielle uh, Reed on Facebook says, I loved Brooke and how she opened herself up to the possibility of love. Well, thank you, Gabrielle. I appreciate that. And, uh, you know, that was, that was something in the book that I really, I really wanted to focus on as far as it's very easy to be cautious um, and that you can be cautious and yet still um, try and stay open to possibilities. And that was something that Brooke really had to weigh. You know, she had to really decide how much was she willing to risk to pursue this. And I actually, I think that that comes out in a lot of my books where you've got a somewhat guarded heroine um, who is compelled to uh, open up emotionally because, you know, because of a really perfect irresistible man that happens to show up. Because, you know, that happens all the time. So. Yes, you're mixing the real with the fantasy, mm -hmm. world, which mm -hmm. is what this is all yeah. about. Real women, fantasy men. <laughs> 
a real women and how men really should be. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> All right, okay. On that note, uh, we're going to start winding down, but I do want us to te uh, want you to tell us about what's coming up next, uh, because I'm hoping it's Lily's story, mm -hmm. but I don't know if that's what we're going to get. So obviously there are three sisters on, uh, on Wenway Island and in Trillium Bay, and the youngest sister, Lily, in the first book, My Kind of You, starts a relationship with a significantly older man. Um, and throughout the second book, Lily and her boyfriend, Tag, are off traveling. Um, and so the third book would be Lily's book, and I do know exactly what happens to her. And uh, my plan is to write that book. Um, I'm not sure if that will be my next book that comes okay. out. It may, I may do one in the middle and then come out with that next one. Um, if you really want to hear Lily's story, please post something on my Facebook page and let me know, and then uh, I might shift gears a little and write that book next instead. Please do it. So, please do that. Yeah. Yeah, please do that, because I want to hear what happens <laughs> to Lily next. So thank you so much for being here. Oh, I did also want to tell our viewers about Fiction from the Heart, mm -hmm. which Tracy and I are both on. It's a Facebook group of 12 authors mm -hmm. who write romantic women's fiction. And we have, there's a lot of shenanigans and a lot of great conversations. Mm -hmm. And it's been lovely getting to know all the women. And that's how Tracy it's and I It's a great group of women. Mm -hmm. so. And a lot of variety. We all... Uh, we all have our own distinct voices, and so, like in my case, I write romantic comedy. Some of the women write stuff that is a little more um, angsty, and some write that is just, just really deep and moving. And um, but all excellent, excellent authors. So all excellent fiction authors. from the heart. We have a Facebook page. Yes. Yeah, so please come join us, mm -hmm. um, and this conversation kind of continues on there. So thank you again, Tracy, for being here. Thank you for having me. It was lovely talking to you, and I'm going to do our outro now. So um, again, you can purchase the book. Tracy will sign it for you. It's just $9.99. And if you're watching this on YouTube, you can still go to authorsvoice.net and purchase the book there so we can continue to do these shows. Um, all right, so uh, now that we're at the end of it, I am going to announce future shows on Author's Voice. Um, upcoming shows are A House Divided, Bjorn's Captison talks to Bancroft, award-winning historian <coughs> David Blight about Frederick Douglass, Prophet of Freedom, tomorrow, January 25th at 3 p.m. On Monday, January 28th, that's this coming Monday, Betsy Bird will be doing a special live event around the American Library Association's Youth Media Awards. The best children's books of the year with our own children's host, that's 9.30 to about noon, Monday morning, January 28th. And on February 12th, mystery author Sarah Peretsky returns to Author's Voice to discuss her latest shell game with Solved host Libby Fisher Hellman. That's noon on February 12th. Um, we have many <laughs> fun hosts coming up on Lit With Love. And you can go find them either on my Facebook page or on authorsvoice.net. And we will see you again soon. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Tracy. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Mm -hmm.